Thanks for watching this presentation, and don't forget to like this video. Please leave your comments and subscribe to the channel for previous videos and more videos coming to our Railfan playlist. <laughs> I've already introduced myself. I'm Christy McCarthy, the Executive Director of the Cheyenne Depot Museum. Um, we're excited tonight. We do have Ed Dickens here as our speaker. So we're going to let him, I know um, you're all happy to see me, but really, you're going to see Ed. So we're going to go ahead and um, have him get started with his introduction. And that's what we're going to do. Ed Dickens. Thank you, Christy. It's good to see everybody tonight, and uh, thank you to the Cheyenne Depot Museum and Visit Cheyenne for having us over here. I thought I'd, uh, I'd start this discussion by kind of narrating the slideshow. You could, you could watch it. <coughs> Excuse me. How many people here were familiar with the donation special that we made? We donated some equipment. Very historic move. You know, this Union Pacific is known for donating steam locomotives back when the steam locomotives were retired in the 19, late 1950s and throughout the 1960s. So it's very uncommon that uh, there was a donation in the day that we live in. The reason we did that is to ensure that these locomotives could enjoy a continuation of their life. In the case of the 5511, that steam locomotive lived in the Cheyenne Roundhouse since 1969. I personally and some other people had always thought we need to see it running, and now we have that opportunity. And, and I think a lot of people here know the history of the 3985. It was one of two Challenger-type locomotives saved in the world, unfortunately, only two. And that locomotive was uh, restored to operation from 1979 until 1981, and it served as a really great public relations ambassador for the UP until 2010. So we had an opportunity through a very unique group of people that were very interested in seeing those steam locomotives preserved. And the best way to preserve a steam locomotive is to make sure that it can operate. It's nice to have a locomotive in your park painted up on display for people to see, but unless it's kept indoors, Mother Nature takes its toll on these big locomotives. So the 3985 have been tucked away in the roundhouse since 2010. And so we made some arrangements and through a process of negotiations, donated both the 5511 and the 3985. So these photographs here were taken by uh, Eric Lindgren, and Derek, uh, Bruce Brackley. I'd also like to introduce Bruce Brackley. He's helping here. And my, uh, I'm the emotional support person for my puppy dog Shadow and my girlfriend Anna. They're here supporting me tonight. So this donation special train was a very uncommon move. So in the year 2022, the Union Pacific gathered this equipment up and made it ready for transport about 850 miles to Silvis, Illinois. And we, we chose a cold part of the year to do this. And it's, it's, yes, and typical windy. So it was quite a trip. I really enjoy this type of stuff. For those of you that know, those of us that work on the steam crews, we, we enjoy working on old equipment. And throughout the discussion of donating the equipment, how are we going to get it there? Are we going to truck it? You know, yeah, you can truck this big heavy equipment, but it makes the best sense, in my mind, take on the truck. So this is what we did. Beautiful picture, 5511, 1923. These are my two bosses. They're asking me how are we going to do this. And we needed, we killed two birds with one stone. We, we took the 4014 out on a, a little mini break-in run. And while we did that, we towed the 5511 around the yard. We wanted to try to get a sense of if it was going to give us problems. It naturally did give us problems. But towing it around the yard like we did really wasn't going to illustrate anything that was pretty minor. So as we got that locomotive uh, moving out of Cheyenne, 
as I mentioned, it was really cold out. And we weren't even outside the city limits very far. As a matter of fact, you could look over your shoulder and you could see the skyline of Cheyenne, Wyoming. And the engine was, we call it, on fire. <laughs> so one of the bearings was heating up. And that happens with that old technology. But we were ready for that. We made some steel wedges and some other things, and we had prepared the locomotive for that long transit. We were, uh, we were prepared to go a long way at 20 miles an hour. So you can imagine what the dispatchers thought. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, as we were leaving that morning, I got a call from a colleague and friend in the dispatch center. And he said, Ed, there's a steam engine out running. Are you on it? And I thought to myself, yeah, I'm on it. He said, hey, uh, is there any way we can pick the speed up to 20 to 40 miles an hour? I said, I'll send you a picture and you'll understand. But that, uh, that says a lot about the UP, that they allow us to do this. And I always, when I talk about our program, it's, it's never, it's never lost on me, excuse me, it's never lost on me that this is just for fun, and they're letting us do it. So here I am squirting the oil all over the thing, here's Austin looking at the Challenger. We knew the Challenger wouldn't give us any trouble, because it had been running for years, and it's a roller bearing locomotive, it's really modern, as steam locomotives go. The 5511, on the other hand, that was going to be the focus of most of our energies and efforts, and it sure was. We put it right out of the tool car, but as I mentioned, this is for the enjoyment of the public. That's the only reason the Union Pacific runs the STEAM program. That's why we restored the big boy. That's why we have this big facility across the way over here. And these locomotives were preserved for the enjoyment of future generations. So that's why we do this. Here we are just getting the locomotive and the train ready to go. We're talking about months of preparation, even for something like this. The mechanical condition of this locomotive was uh, a concern, of course. We donated some other equipment along the way, so we gathered up a lot of equipment. That particular locomotive, the Chicago Northwestern F7, was destined to Boone, Iowa. And fortunately, we were able to preserve that locomotive. A lot of the locomotives uh, get scrapped. It's almost unthinkable today in the world that we live in that a locomotive, even a diesel locomotive, could be scrapped. But in the world that we live in, that is always a possibility. Well, we're not gonna let that happen, so we donated these locomotives, and we made what we call a hospital train. There's a funny story about the hospital train. Throughout our discussions, our planning with my colleagues, Several of my colleagues don't have an operating background. So I'd like to build their understanding of just what it is we will be doing. And when you use the word hospital train, what does that mean? To people who have been around the railroad for a long time, a hospital train is a train that's carrying equipment that is damaged, wrecked, and it's, it's going home. It implies it's not necessarily anything medical, it's just a term that the railroad used. It's all this, this equipment assembled together, the air brakes don't work, there might be other problems with it that need some type of special attention. So we're there to give it that special attention. As we were talking about what we're going to do, I talked about this light plant and this flat car, and that really didn't resonate with people. Well, one of our bosses, she's a, an AVP, magnificent woman, Maureen Halbert, to her credit, this is her right here. She was with us from Sydney, Nebraska, all the way through. We rolled into Sydney, Nebraska. Of course, it was probably 11 o'clock at night. I don't remember now, but it was late. And here we come. They were towing a light plant behind a pickup truck. And I had indicated that we don't need that light plant. We have one. Well, it was dark, so when we stopped just as the sun was setting, we fired up that light we had two of the lights facing forward toward the 3985 and two lights facing rearward. And nearly every train that we passed, 
said, what in the world is that? As this locomotive, a standard locomotive, was pulling the 3985 flat car, illuminating the countryside with these two steam locomotives, and we wound that light plant up in the air so you could see it. It was about the height of one of these big, long, or high double stack cars. We rolled into town and we got into position and I walked up to my boss and I said, well, what do you think about this? <laughs> and she goes, I think I don't appreciate you guys enough. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are pulling the syllabus after 850 miles. And this is the crew. Could you stop that for just a second? Sure, let me, uh... So we got these Yushanka hats. Oh, there's a good one right there those big winter hats. We also have the responsibility to deploy the rotary snowplow. And in the rotary snowplow equipment gear, I was in the military, so I have everybody what we call an alert bag. It's what you have in the military with all your emergency gear. Well, I have my, my cold weather cap. When we got to Sydney, everybody went to Cabela's and they bought one too. <laughs> it was very, very cold. So I'm going to step over here so I can introduce everybody. So here we have one of our network planning colleagues. He's just an outstanding support for us and a good personal friend, Vic Stone. Greg Richardson, he works in our technology group and IT group, another very supportive colleague from Omaha. John Stravino, newest member of our crew. Our big boss, Marine Halber, as I mentioned. Marine is an outstanding support for us, a very detailed, uh, very, very good planner. Ted Schulte recently retired, right hand man, ace fireman, very good at so many details in the shop. Right here is Kurt Clark. He's a fireman, locomotive engineer, all around excellent person. You can't tell right there, but Kurt is 6'6". He's huge. He breaks a lot of tools. He is very strong. So anytime we have any kind of big, tough work, Kurt's the one that does it. Here's my right-hand man, Austin Barker. Uh, he's just a jack of everything in our shop. Excellent talent, tremendous passion. At the age of 12, he had a big boy 4014 sticker in his room that his father had got him. Here we have Tom Sephora, another one of our support team members in Council Bluffs. He helps us with planning and logistics. We have Robert Bondi, uh, he's a good supporter and a friend and he was along just to kind of help us, just overall general health and assistance. He works with a water treatment company that we use. Myself and my big hat, Bruce Kirk, a former gunsmith, and he's a member of our crew. He too is retired, but he comes along with us to give us assistance. Garland Baker, outstanding machinist. Garland can machine anything, and he has a tremendous passion and skill for machining and fabricating. Jimmy Thompson, our other part of the duo, the Boilermaker. You can always tell Jimmy with that, that fantastic smile. Jimmy is an ace welder, and Jimmy is part of the crew that is moving up in progression. So he has responsibilities for locomotive inspections, and, and his skill is we're continuing to develop him. And of course, many know Paul Gershio from the Rail Giants Museum. Paul was part of the effort to donate the 4014 to us. Thank you, Bruce. So we'll just go through a few more slides here. This is inside the Silvis facility, the former Rock Island shop. There's another shot of us on the 5511. We had a little ceremony where we, we technically it's a transfer agreement, and we duplicated the same type of agreements that the railroad would have, the supply department would have given the Rail Giants Museum or any other organization that they donated a piece of equipment to. And it's just very, a very simple purchase order from the Union Pacific. You know, it's all this perfunctory information on there. But we drafted a similar one up just for them. You can see the runaround hose because the air brakes weren't working on the Challenger. And here we are again, and here's Steve Stamberg up there with a big smile. Steve is the, the man that's in charge of the, the Silvis operation. I've known Steve for years. And there's another, another view of the, the actual event. So as planning goes, we had planned to be at Silvis at 2 p.m. 
and we had a lot of delays and problems along the way. Some of the problems were mechanical related, others were weather related, and some were just network related. Now we had some challenges finding crews, and we ended up rerouting the trip over the Iowa interstate. Our original plan was to work our way up to Boone, donate that locomotive that I talked about, that F7, to the Boone and Senior Valley, then we would go down to Des Moines, Iowa, then get on the Iowa interstate and work our way across. Well, as luck would have it, we were just really challenged with some other things. And at the last minute, we had an opportunity to shoot across the Iowa interstate. And we had calculated that if we run 18 hours straight, that would get us back on schedule. So we went from 6 a.m. till about 2 a.m. And we arrived at South Amana right around our approximate bedtime. <laughs> well, it was actually a little later than that. In the morning, we took off and we arrived into Silvis 80 minutes after the time that we had told them we would be there three weeks prior, or a month prior, if I remember right. So that was pretty darn good that the Union Pacific was able to deliver these locomotives. They had planned a nice dinner event and a nice ceremony. So had we been later than that, that could have impacted their, their event. But it worked out beautifully because they had all of the, they had tables set up, they had wine, cheese, and, and lots of benefactors there to celebrate the arrival of the equipment. So as the event was starting, their kickoff event, the 3985 rolled in. And in hushed tones, it became really quiet. And here comes the challenger rolling into the silver shop with all their their beautiful tables and everything set up. It worked out perfectly. We couldn't have planned it better. Well, I think uh, what we're going to do is we'll get started here. And I put this presentation together. It's a little bit different. This is I'm calling this one UP Steam a look back. So we talk about what we started to do when we brought the big boy home. For those that don't know the complete story, I'll give you a quick summary. We had an opportunity back in 2012, and interestingly enough, it's the same benefactor that is the main benefactor behind the group at Silva's. He had approached the Union Pacific with an offer for them to restore 4,000, a big boy. He, like many people, loves Union Pacific steam locomotives in his history. And the timing was perfect because one of his friends had recently retired as a senior counsel. And so this individual, very credible person, both of them were able to present this idea to the Union Pacific. I don't think any other, there would be any other way that you could. You know, think about approaching a class one railroad with an offer. I'd like you to build this, rebuild this locomotive. I'm not even sure it would get that far up the chain of command before people would say thanks, but no thanks. So on that fateful day, I happened to be in town, and I was the new, the new person in my role, and this individual had characterized it along the lines of, asked that new, new guy if he'd be interested in restoring the 4,000, a big boy. My boss, excitedly called me up. I kind of thought I was in trouble. You know, when you're a new, new person and a senior vice president calls you to meet with him, a lot of things go through your mind. And we had found the numerous, numerous discoveries in the shop, so we had, had several conversations about things. So as I went into his office, he got right down to business. He goes, would you be interested in restoring a big boy? And I remember this expressionless expressionless feeling you would think that it'd be this excitement and i'd be just hard to contain myself but two things were going through my mind yeah i was excited but i knew he was serious so i needed to convey to him what he, i wanted to make sure that i understood what he was asking me because i knew what that meant a big boy hasn't run on the union pacific in, since 1959 it's like 52 years and uh, more than that, really. And it's a massive undertaking. At that time, we were talking about 
restoring the Challenger, you know, a complete frame up rebuilding of that locomotive and work on the 844, work on the shop, all the things that we had talked about, you know, the clean up the shop, putting the crane in, and all of the infrastructure that we had talked about doing to support the program going forward. And I, uh, I remember telling him, I said, you realize that the big boy is two 844s, because he knew all about that 844. So we're talking twice the water, twice the fuel, twice the oil, twice the grease. And I even threw in there twice the people. And he wasn't phased at all by that. And so we left the conversation, and he was going to take that to the next level, which is additional executive approvals. Called me up the next day, I met with him again, and we talked about the next steps. And I felt it important to remind him that the Union Pacific doesn't own any big boys anymore. We gave them all away. The last one that we really had technically was the 4023, and that would have been a really good restoration candidate because it had the least amount of miles and it was of the second class. It had type A superheaters, and it was, as I mentioned, in the second class. And he said, you can't have that one. Because he was part of the, he was involved in moving it up in Kinetic Park. For those of you that know where that locomotive is, it was quite an effort to truck it up there and put it on display. So he said to me, and I'll never forget this one, go get us a big boy. <laughs> so think about being in my position and you've got a senior vice president that's just empowered you to go get a big boy steam locomotive. I have a friend from Australia. He FaceTimes me almost every night. <laughs> Excuse me. Aren't these cell phones great? <laughs> Actually, do love them. And he calls two or three times unless I pick up. So I, I took that as the ultimate and tasking authority. And so we went on process of negotiation, but I knew that I wanted that 4014 out of all the other locomotives. And it's interesting, there's there's always speculation about projects, and, and I think even some magazines and a video company has characterized that the Union Pacific sent teams of people all over the country looking at these big boys. And I'm thinking, no, we didn't. <laughs> I knew which one that I wanted. And we're very lucky that they gave it back to us. So one of the funnest things that we did, I'll start by showing you a few slides here, was actually going out and starting to work on the big boy. So we wanted to kind of plant our flag, and this was right during the LA County Fair. This would have been in late July, or excuse me, June 20, 2013. And so here comes the UP steam crew. We've loaded up a lot of equipment and trailers. We've got two vehicles and we're going to start making this locomotive ready which we've got to take a lot of things apart on we've got to inspect a lot of things and it really it went really quick so as we took the pistons the pistons were up in the tender we staged them in front of like one of my favorite locomotives the 9000 class and we started clearing everything out and getting everything ready to go we brought in big track panels we rebuilt certain parts of the air brake system. I mean, we had already done some of this to the 844, so we had all the tools and equipment to do that. So rather than just kind of do a halfway job there, let's just go ahead. It doesn't take that much time. We did this level of work, cleaning all this stuff up. We got the lubricators ready to go, and we were really, really making good progress. As we started to move the locomotive, that's what it looked like. So now we're getting the locomotive into a curve, and what you're looking at is the front part of the engine, and this is called a wear liner. This is your centering device, and it's not really dirty, we just greased it up really good. So what happens is the locomotive goes into a curve, the front engine begins to articulate and move around, and exposes this surface here. So we would scrub it, clean it really good, boil it up, and then the next opportunity, when it turns in the other direction, you could do the same thing. So we were trying to kill two birds with one stone, so to speak. And this was a very fun day. I remember this was all happening so fast. And we went out to get the big boy, and we're planning to bring it home, and we want to get going on the, on the project so we can really get this project done quickly. 
how are we going to move the locomotive? When you go through in your mind, how are you going to do that? And you think, well, we could pay a company to do it, and we could do, move it this way, we could move it that way. And throughout the entire process of that, who's going to supervise it? Well, me, us, the UP. Well, why don't we just do it ourselves? And that's kind of the attitude that I have, that we want to do everything that we can internally. So I bought some HO gauge snap track and a little model HO gauge truck, and a friend had one of those monogrammed big boys. I borrowed that from him, and I wrote down a plan of what we were going to do, and I took everybody out to the restaurant. This was in Pomona, California, and I began to explain to them how we're going to move the big boy. Up until that point, I had left that part of the details, that part of the plan out. And they knew I was serious because they know me, but they kind of looked like, I don't know how this is going to work. They never really verbalized that. So this is what it looked like. So the Union Pacific gave us 22 big 40-foot track panels. Those track panels are 7,400 pounds each. So they take a big machine, and we literally just began to simply them like a model railroad. Well, the track panel is straight. When you go to curb it, it's not like a model railroad. Those are wood. And you hear all kinds of cracking and snapping. So you have to curb it really gently, and it's very laborious to physically move everything. And it looks a little rough, but before long, it looks really good. And next thing you know, you've got yourself a pretty nice looking railroad that literally fits right down on the pavement. Where we needed to, we put plywood down. But when you do the math, you're only looking at 40 pounds per square inch. I know that's just a number. But it really doesn't do anything to the, to the parking lot. This particular part of the parking lot doesn't look too good anyway. But if we needed to, we would put plywood underneath. You can see little boards here and there. But we got pretty good at it, and it took us seven days to go one mile. So we scooped that locomotive all the way across the parking lot, and before long, we were ready to tie in. And that in itself was really something neat to coordinate. We had our partners at the uh, Metrolink, they worked really well with us, and we actually cut the track over. We didn't put a switch in or anything else. We cut their railroad, shifted it over, connected it with the track that we built, and we pulled the locomotive right out there. And here we are all on the tender. I'm sure, looking back on it, how funny that must have looked. We built a little plywood deck inside there so we could kind of supervise things and we stored a bunch of parts and everything in there. And we invited some city officials. We have the mayor there, we've got the police chief, and we've got some other dignitaries riding in the cab. It was just a, just a, a fun time. That was some of the funnest, funnest things that I've ever done. This is the ceremony, very similar to the ceremony that we had with the 3985. And this is the actual 1961 document that the Union Pacific presented to the Southern California chapter of the Railway and Locomotive Historical Society. So they're giving that back to us, and we're presenting them with a new sales order for a locomotive that we donated to them. So we got everything ready to go. We had a little golden spike ceremony we drove a little golden spike. And in railroad fashion, we cut a ribbon. But you don't cut a ribbon on the railroad with scissors. You cut a ribbon with a cutting torch. And that ribbon is a ribbon of steel. That's how number three track in 1953 was opened. The president of the railroad cut it with a torch. And so we did the same thing. We had this piece of steel, UP 4014 on one side, UP 3105, which is the number of the diesel that we donated them. And I have that in my office to this day, and they have the 4014. So it was really fun. Well, when we got back, we had a lot of work to do, and we couldn't just immediately start working on the big boy. We had to start working on the 844. And we started to work on the 844, and we took the tubes and flues out. The tubes and flues were leaking, which is a problem. Not that uncommon to have leaky tubes and flues. You've got to correct it. They can't leak forever. In this instance, you just can't continue to re-roll them. That's a mechanical problem.
process or weld them, by that time they're too far gone. As we pulled the tubes and flues out, this is what we discovered. Just tons, literally, hundreds of pounds of scale and mud. So this is in the very front part of the boiler. And what we discovered is the front several washout plugs had not been removed for a period of time and it was not adequately washing that part of the boiler. So this had been accumulating for years. So we disassembled everything and we took it apart. So you'll see in a little bit here the pictures of the 4014 of the similar view. And these are all steel tubes. And the water flows around all of these tubes here. Well, in this instance on the 844, it is literally occluded, just filled with this heavy scale. We're talking years of accumulated scale. You know, this isn't something that's going to accumulate in a year or two. This is years of accumulation. The only way to fix it is to disassemble this. Well, before we actually got into the work, I had informed my bosses, we've got some problems with the 844, we're going to fix them. We're going to run Cheyenne Frontier Days in 2013, and then we, we can't run the rest of the year, we'll fix it. We'll have it fixed by next year. When we got into this level of work, it's not going to be fixed next year. So we continue to tear those tubes and flues out. This is the tube sheet. And interestingly enough, this was the same failure mode that happened in 1999. You can see the heavy rusting for those. There's a technical name for that. It's called oxygen self erosion. It's a very dangerous condition where the metal is dissolving away. And so the metal is no longer strong enough to be inside a boiler subjected to this 300 pounds of pressure. And that's exactly why the 844 had a problem back in 1999. So had we not corrected it, we would have had a similar failure mode eventually. So we got working on the 844. We got past the frustration of not being able to start working on the 4014, rolled up our sleeves. And I'm a believer that I really believe that all things happen for a reason. Not only were we able to discover those conditions and repair them, but it gave us an opportunity to start gearing up and equipping the shop and everything that we needed. We would have geared up eventually when we got into the 4014 project, but we didn't have stable taps, hammers, tools, all of the things that you need. We had a lot of that equipment, but it's just worn out and old. All of the tools from the steam era, a lot of the tools can be rebuilt, and we did that. But your taps and like the, the actual hand tool pieces, we just made all that stuff new. We tried resharpening some of it. We just said, all right, we're going to start fresh. And that really gave us a springboard to jump into the project. So you're looking at a blowdown valve and stay bolts. I'll get into more stay bolts a little bit later. But this is the actual right front side of the 844. And we've got a driver on. I mean, we really tore into that locomotive in order to fix it the way we needed to. So we get the 844 all together in 2016 and we ran it. It worked beautifully. We replaced 435 staples. I know that's just a number, but that's a lot. We replaced over 800 on the big boy. Anybody want to take a guess how many staples are in the 4,000? Anybody, anybody been studying the blueprints? Throw up your hand and just throw out a number. Somebody just throw a number out there. How many? 1,200, okay. 2,400, we're getting close. Not quite halfway there yet. 5,000? 4,442 staples. A practical. Yeah. He said, you know every single one of them. There's an awful lot of staples. So as a locomotive sat in California, one of the reasons that I, in my mind, I'll just back up a little bit and tell you a story in 2011. I was out in California on other business and I needed to take a rules class. And the only one they had left of December of 2011 was in Colton. While I was in Colton, I decided I'm gonna to go to that museum in Pomona because I heard they have a 4,000 and a 9,000. I went out there, they happened to be open. I walked in, looked at the locomotive, they had the jacket off and it was painted. And it was California. I hadn't really ever been to California that much in my life. I just really impressed with the overall 
I mean, who wouldn't be? Los Angeles is huge, but it's a dry climate, and it's about, I'm guessing, 40 miles inland, so there's not a lot of salt there. But the locomotive was like in suspended animation. It had rust, it looked old, it looked tired, it looked worn out, but it really didn't look to be that bad. Packed that away in my mind. That's why I wanted the 4014. So before we made it look like this, it kind of looked like the 844 did. Very rusty, lots of deterioration, and a lot of this underneath here, you'll see all of those connection points for those 4,442 staples. So now we've got all that fixed up. All of this piping is new. We've rebuilt some of these big valves you see here. These are original part of the locomotives, but all these other valves are new valves. So when you work on a steam locomotive, anybody work on a steam locomotive in here? We got some steam people, a steam tractor. Steam is amazingly powerful. You think of it as water. You're boiling a pot of spaghetti on your stove, and it burns you. Ah! You know, steam coming out. Maybe you're pressure cooking. It burns you pretty darn good. Well, think about steam at 300 psi and 425 degrees. You respect that. Well, all of these valves here, these are what we call our turret valves, and they take steam underneath, inside the boiler, up into the dome, and that's what powers what we call the appliances. So the blower, the atomizer, the air pump, the dynamo, injectors, the heat lines, all of those things, all of those auxiliary appliances. Well, these valves are massive castings. They're so thick, the walls are thick, big, huge flanges. The core castings themselves are good. They're machinable. There's a lot of material in there that you can machine. But we rebuilt everything else, so everything else is new. The valve handle, the stem, all of that stuff. Same thing on this one. All these valves are store-bought, and they're the type of valve that you'd find in a power plant. You'd probably find some of them on a low-pressure Navy ship. You know, they're forged steel. They're designed for that. Sometimes you look at a steam locomotive in a park and you're like, I really want to restore this old locomotive. And it has a lot of those valves from the steam locomotive era. And some of them might be pretty good, but some of them need to go in a museum. And what you do is you source all this new stuff, big heavy duty swing, spring checks, and all of this piping. Part of our gearing up in our shop was making all of this piping and doing all this work ourselves. So you've got to take this heavy wall pipe, and it's not pipe that you'd find at Home Depot. This is special pipe that you have to order. Really heavy, thick wall. And you bend it and you form it, and you duplicate the pipe that you took off that doesn't work anymore. And this is what it looked like in the 844 when we were all done. New cap floor, all new oak, rebuilt air brake, everything completely rebuilt. Here's our general electric spring out there. So if we were to go back to 70 years, you wouldn't hear that big 7 FDL TE 12 cylinder diesel engine. That's 4,500 horsepower, $3 million, AC, alternating current traffic, huge power. You would have probably, maybe a 4,000. So here we are back in the 844. This is what it looked like when we were all rebuilt. Just a showpiece of an engine. The grandest locomotive, and I say that with respect because I'm a UP person, but I love all big engines, the 611, and I'm gonna leave engines out, please don't be offended. But I, I, this locomotive is the last steam locomotive that the UP bought. This is the last one. So in my mind, this is our Air Force One. Think about that. When I was a young person, I served in the United States Air Force, and I only saw that aircraft from afar because it's what we call a priority A aircraft. It has the same priority as nuclear weapons and fighters, nuclear missile silos. But I was impressed that there was this aircraft that was entrusted to the United States Air Force to fly our chief executive around. And when you walk under the wings, I didn't get to get that close to it, but underneath the wings in that beautiful blue paint scheme was USAF. So to me, this 
is the UP's Air Force One. So if the, U if the 844 is Air Force One, what is the 44T? We have any, any Marine Corps veterans in here? How about Marine One? That's the helicopter that the Marines fly, the chief executive. So that's what the 44T is. So here we are inside Marine One. And this is like suspended animation. This is after we've cleaned it, we've inspected everything. This is the interior of the 4014. Big heavy duty braces. This is a big reinforcing patch on the inside. There's another one just like it on the outside. The boiler on that engine is that thick. It is huge. A steam locomotive, the best way to describe it is like this portable rock crusher on wheels. This, this machine that is so heavy built. If we were to build a steam locomotive today, with all due respect to our designers and, and people that would build a new locomotive, they probably wouldn't build it to last 100 years. Because we don't build things like that. We engineer it to work a certain amount of time. The big boy and all steam locomotives built in that era were designed with such a huge safety factor. You designed it, and then you multiplied that design many different times depending on the component that you're talking about. So we're talking about just massive, huge, massive structures. That's what it looks like in the very front. You can see some holes down here. That's what we call the front tube sheet. This is what it looked like when we pulled the engine out. In an articulated steam locomotive, when you're going to do heavy duty work, you've got to take the thing apart. You can't just take a wheel out here and there. You can't just take this part off here and there. You really have to completely disassemble that. And in my mind, going back to that conversation with the senior vice president who asked me if I wanted to restore this locomotive, I told him I want to do it right. And I, I predicted to him that it would take us about five years. And we talked money, we talked time. And I said, I want to take my time and I want to do it right. And I want to make a lot of new parts. And he just smiled at me. He was a civil engineer, so he understood that what I was talking about. So let's talk about this right here. This represents essentially the 844. This is just the front engine. 844, of course, has 80 inch drivers. The cast engine bed, of course, is a little bit longer because of those 80 inch drivers. The valves are nearly the same. The cylinders are just a little bit smaller on a big boy. The 4014 has 24 inch cylinders. We bored them out to 24 inches. Anybody know how big the cylinders are on the 844? 25. So here we are. We've got an engine, a 4884. 24 inch cylinders. A big boy is a 484. 25 inch cylinders. Still 300 psi. So it's no exaggeration when you talk about what it is, what it looks like. All the springs, here's all of the lines, and this is why you have to take the locomotive apart. One of the, no pun intended, challenges on the Challenger was all of these lines, every one of them, all of the steam lines and the air lines down in the frame were rotted, rusted, and leaked, and they were replaced with rubber hoses. The rubber hoses went around and they were kind of zip tied around through the frame, the only way to fix that is to take that front engine out. And that's exactly what we did here. Take it apart, strip it down. And this is a daunting task because you've got all of the mechanism on the 844 times two. And this is what it looks like underneath. I know these are just kind of almost confusing in a way, these big pictures, but these are the huge giant coil springs that are part of the suspension system. And all those are brand new. So we didn't waste any time when we were working on the 844, even though we really had to get our noses to the grindstone and get going on that project because we wanted to get this. So as at the same time when we were working on the 844, we'd go in, we'd do a little bit of work, send a few emails, and we'd order the springs. Or we'd order, order some more parts or we order this, we order that, so we can get this equipment on the way. 
Because if we would have waited for when we were finished in 2016 with that 844 project and then started ordering everything, there was no way in the world that we would have ever been done. So it was, it was one of the funnest parts of project management, putting all of it together, figuring out all this stuff. More big heavy duty suspension parts. And these pictures really don't do justice to how big these parts are. This is part of the suspension system. The technical name for that is called equalizer over the driver. So on the wheels, on the rear two wheels on the rear engine, you notice it's under the firebox there. And there's no room for those springs that you saw in that first picture. So what they did is they put this equalizer, those are normally down here, they put it on top. And they put the springs down below. Well, those big, huge castings, four people can't pick that thing up. It's so big. We went into those, and throughout the whole process, you can spend a lot of time and effort welding up the old parts and then remachining them. And you've got you've invested a lot of time in an old part, and recognizing that these parts had over a million miles on them—17 years, a million miles—they got a lot of wear. So we just made them brand new. And this is where it is right here. I know it's kind of it's all black paint, but it's kind of hard to see. This is where the wheel goes right here. And this is those springs I mentioned there. It's just a, a masterpiece of a design, especially when you think that these locomotives were designed with, with paper and ink and pencil by hand, slide rules. You know, no computers, no 3D CAD, no fancy modeling. You know, this locomotive was put together, designed piece by piece in a room with draftsmen by hand. It's fascinating when you look at how well it's built and how well it fits together. Now these are the big drivers. We had those rolling around in the shop, cleaning them up for the third time. This is what it looks like on the inside of those things, these big giant roller bearings. The size of these axles, these axles are huge, They're like a telephone pole, a giant telephone pole. Big, huge, heavy duty rollers. And this reflection here is the surface of the oil lubrication. It's the same type of oil you put in a, a differential. This is what it looks like when you're looking under the locomotive. And I like talking about it this way. It would be so fun for us if we could, when we display the locomotive, when we travel with it, if there would be a way we could put a mirror underneath there. So everybody could walk and they could look under and see what it looks like underneath because it's all new, it's all clean, all heavy duty parts, these big springs in here, painted different colors, we can kind of see those. And here's the benefit of having that brand new big overhead crane in our shop. We started cleaning the shop up in 2013. We put this crane in in 2017. We wouldn't have that big crane, I'm not sure we really would have been able to get the job done. That enables to do so much work. So this is what it looks like when you take your model locomotive and you hold it in your hand like this. It's the same view. We're down underneath what we call our drop table and we're working on some, some equipment. I like talking about this because it's a good illustration of the brakes here. You can see these, we call this as a driver brake. Each one of those little cast iron brake shoes are custom made they're different from the 844. Yes, they're different from the Challenger. Even though these locomotives were built very late and they were working toward making as many parts common, the brake shoes were not common. So we custom made those. Anybody want to take a guess of just what one of those brake shoes costs? What's the cost to put a brake job on your car? $250 a piece. Perfect, pardon me? $3,000. 3, there, he got it right. He's done some more. 250 bucks a piece. So we have $1,000 worth of brake shoes on just one axle. Because there's two here, there's two on the other side. But you just can't change these just that simple. The locomotive is so big, when they design these locomotives, they have to design them within a certain profile. What that means is they have to fit the railroad, the existing railroad. The Union Pacific wasn't going to redesign the entire railroad because they're buying some big locomotive that's going to do the job for them. 
It had to fit the tunnels, it had to fit the bridges, it had to fit the turntables, some of them. Then they compromised. They ended up putting turntables here and there. They changed a few parts of the infrastructure, but not that many. Well, what that means is, in order for you to change a brake shoe, you've got to be in a pit like this. You can't change it from the outside. So if we're at Sydney, Nebraska, Rollins, Wyoming, Roseville, California, wherever we are, if we don't have a pit, and we have a brake shoe that's condemnable, that means technically the inspector will say, your engine's out of service until you fix that brake shoe. So to guard against that, we run with a diesel for dynamic braking. But anyway, that's a little bit of a side conversation. That's why you don't want to wear your brakes out on your big boy. More big heavy duty parts. This is the front piece of the, uh, the very front part of the, the front four wheels. When we took that front engine apart, this came apart in three pieces. It was broken. Who knows how long it had been broken? There was a story when they moved the locomotive from 4014 to 1989, they had to move the railroad exhibit to make room for another exhibit. They hired a contractor, they set some, some track up, and this contractor had some heavy equipment and he was looking at these old steam locomotives. He moved one or two of them. They didn't move very good. He was pushing them with a bulldozer. They pushed them down the way a little bit. They got on that, that 4014. Oh boy, this thing's big. They got against it with a bulldozer, pushed it, and it took off rolling. <laughs> they weren't ready for that. Boom, crash. It ran into those engines down the way. And it broke some stuff on the front end, the coupler, the pilot. And probably that, that's probably where that broke. No way for us to know that because all of this entire piece is, is hidden. This is all well up within a frame as you'll see in a minute. This piece here is barely visible. If you climb down in and shine your flashlight, you can kind of see the top of it. So this is what it looks like when you're putting it together. This is the front engine here. You can't see any of this when the engine's running. This is a brand new bushing. Another brand new wear surface, brand new pin. And this is the equalizer. What the equalizer does is it takes the weight of the locomotive and it transfers that weight to those front four wheels. And as those front four wheels are going down the track, they guide it or pilot it. It's called an engine truck. You can call it pilot wheels. Very, very important part of the locomotive. On the 4000s, on the Challengers, those, those engine trucks were connected to the rest of the spring rigging. The 844 is not like that. There's just one big piece up there in the front of the 844 that sits on those. Still does the same thing. It's just not connected to the rest of the engine. So when I say we rebuilt this locomotive, we rebuilt it. One of the reasons you want to pull the front engine out of the 3985, all of this stuff in here is probably extremely worn. All new. This, you can see the gold coloration on it is actually bronze welded up, so you've got dissimilar alloys, and it's well lubricated, so it'll last a long time, because that's actually moving up and down. As that locomotive's going down the track, that whole device, when you look at that locomotive, we put a GoPro on the front, and it is the neatest thing to watch that engine, and you watch all of that, all those parts moving in concert, they're all brand new. And there's the piece that it made to right here, now we've got it all greased up really good with valve oil, really good thick like molasses oil. And we're just lowering this whole front engine. So we've got 95 tons suspended in the air. The back of it is, is supported with our crane. The front ported, portion of it is supported with two 50-ton jacks. And we lift this whole thing up in the air. And then we roll those front four wheels. All of this is new. New wheels. Some of the neatest stuff on the engine, I wish I could show you what this really looked like and how big it was sitting in here. Brand new roller bearings here, new coil springs, new leaf springs, just new, 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 just all new stuff. The chance of a lifetime, a guy like me is like winning the lottery. What would you do if you won the lottery? I'd restore a big boy. Well, I got that chance. Now we're inside of the boiler on that 4014. When the locomotive was sitting out there for many, many years, it would rain every now and then. It doesn't rain a lot out there, 
But when it did, for a few years, the, the stacks were covered. They eventually covered them, but for that period of time, the rain would get down in the smoke box, would get down in the whistle, and then we get down in the smoke box, and it would go through the tubes and flues and come out down here, and this whole area was rusted. Not the end of the world. That's what you make a cutting torch for. And you cut all of that metal out. So look at the size of this patch. We have another picture from the other side. This is what it looks like on the outside. Each one of these is a little welded cap that covers all of those staples I was talking about. And this is what the staples look like when you're done. This work is done by hand. So you've got a, a rivet gun, and you get strong, but you really respect the boiler makers and the people that built these locomotives because these weren't put together with robots and machines and automated equipment and assembly line. This was put together by hand and we did it as well. So there's uh, stable driving is hard on your body. Uh, tube rolling is not quite so hard, but beating tubes is pretty rough. Stable driving is tough. Austin has a record he did the most, and I, I'm in there somewhere. Jimmy did a whole bunch. On the 844, I did a lot of them. But I, uh, I just happen to have a lot of conference calls and other things when they needed to do that work. I'm kind of kidding, of course. And this is what it looks like when you're done. So the Union Pacific was well on this just to make it that much better, to, ha to go guard against leakage. And here we are, this is the Brick Mason. One of the, the duties that I assigned to myself, I like doing that kind of work. I did the brick work on the 844, and now we're putting all of the refractory. When you're burning oil, this is the burner. So this is the oil conversion on the 4014. That oil heat is extremely hot. Coal burns really hot, but that, that oil flame is intensely hot, and that flame is gonna project outward as it's being burned, and curl up and then go through the tubes and flues and out the smoke box. You can't have that metal exposed to the direct heat of that flame. It will get too hot. So you create what we call a fire pan. That's what this lower area is, and this is all an adaptation of what the Union Pacific would have built. One of the fascinating things about the oil conversion is that a lot of people were under the impression that it was not possible. There had been a story written years ago about one of the locomotives that were converted to oil, and it was rumored that it didn't work out that well. 4,005. That's right, 4,005 in Denver. And that's really not the entire rest of the story. So we designed that fire pan and came up with that brick arrangement. And if you look on the side of the 4014, you see the numbers. It's got 4884-1, the cylinder fraction, 24, 24 over 32, 68, and it's got DB, Dickens, Barker. Austin and I sat down and we kind of figured out some things. Again, we can't take credit for it. All we did was what the UP would have done. We took an upgraded version of what's in the 844 that works very well, and we adjusted it, adapted it, did some calculations on the flow going through there, and that's what we came up with. This is what it looks like in the very top of the boiler. Again, you can see how smooth and nice it is. You see a little bit of rust here and there, but all of this structure, all rebuilt, all heavy duty, big heavy duty Emron paint, and we put this together pretty darn quick, which is a credit to the Union Pacific for letting us do it and supporting us. Insulation on the cylinder, big heavy duty insulation, insulation on the jacketing. Now this is just, let me get my bearings here. This is a few weeks before we, we had to run. And you think about all the work that lies ahead of you. I remember there were times when, you know, I don't, I don't frequent social media much. I'm on Facebook now. Back then, I really wasn't. And there was a lot of pessimism, more pessimism than I thought there would be, about restoring the big boy. And oh, they're never going to get it done. Oh, it won't work. And you know, all of this pessimism. So I decided, well, rather than try to oppose that, I'm going to feed into it. 
I know that's not, that's kind of bad. But I, so when I made these update videos, I would show parts of the engine that really weren't put together. Most people never would see that, but those that were pessimistic and negative about it, that would just spur them on. Oh, look at that, they're not, they're never gonna get it done. And next thing you know, we got it done. They didn't know we were putting together a big locomotive kit. That's what it looked like late at night. I lived at the shop for, gosh, five months, 24-7. Our air brakes that we rebuilt. We did the same thing on the 844. That's why I say that, that things work out for a reason, you know, that, that you, you're depressed and you're frustrated you have to rebuild this locomotive that was rebuilt not that much earlier. But in so doing, it, it, it builds all of your infrastructure to get to the point to where you need to be. And we're just about finished here. Uh, this is part of this, the, uh, the valve gear. Again, this is all brand new, the link. A lot of the rod, rod hardware is new. The mechanism that holds the links called a trunny, that's all new, the bearings in there are new. And I, I chose this picture because the chain invites a lot of questions on social media. And when we tour with the locomotive, people ask, what is that chain for? Does anybody want to take a guess? Mr. Finch, you know the answer. <laughs> anybody want to take a guess? What does that chain do? That's right, it's, it, it, it operates a lubricator. One of the designs, and, and we built these links exactly from the blueprint, and it still has that little boss right there with that connection. And there was a little rocker mechanism here and a rod that went back here that actuated the lubricator, kind of like on the 844 and the Challenger. Well, that was a problem because it wouldn't stay together. When you're running 40 miles an hour, 45, 50 miles an hour, before we put the chain guards on that engine, that chain is dancing. Because it's going back and forth, and that link. Well, that little mechanism would break. And it's interesting that the shops in Denver, Colorado were the ones that came up with that idea. And they, they changed all the big boys to that design. And here we are machining all that together. Garland Baker doing the machine work in our shop. These are tapered fit bolts. And this is an intricate masterpiece. Just look at that beautiful machine work. And that's a forging. So what that means is that the steel is manufactured in a way that makes it the strongest. And here we are on the connecting rods. Very, very important part of the locomotive. When you watch that locomotive going down the track, you can see those things. Think about the force that those things are, the, the power, the thrust being exerted on those. The physical inertia force, the rotating physical forces of that thing moving and changing direction multiple times a second, you know, really gives you a respect of the design. Part of one of Ted's jobs, because he's so meticulous, he, he polished these. These things, they look brand new, don't they? These are from the 1950s. Most of these were replaced after the war. But we machine all these surfaces make new eccentric cranks. These are some of the old stuff that we took out of these locations here. And very, very meticulously machine those. Because every time you machine them, you take that much, you take material out. Because the hole wears, and when it wears, it's not round anymore. So to make it round, you've got to machine it round. That means you're going to take metal, you're going to cut, you're going to remove material. So when this thing was new, that was pretty thick. Now it's not quite as thick. Same thing on the 844. People say, oh yeah, the 844 can run 100 miles an hour. Not with me. Because <laughs> I know how those rods are worn. And you might do. You might get 90. You might not. One of those things breaks at speed. It could be the end. It certainly ruin your day. These are the throttle valves, another really fascinating part of the engine. Again, they're forged steel exactly what they would have made back in the day. Very most important part of the steam locomotive. Anybody want to take a guess? What's the horsepower on the big boy? Back in 1941, Railway Age did an article for American Locomotive Company and Union Pacific Railroad. And on the title page, 7,000 horsepower locomotive built for Union Pacific Railroad. 
They tested them and they were 63.49. I rounded up to 7,000. So that's essentially the power of the boiler. So that boiler horsepower at 7,000 horsepower is contained within these small seven little valves, these harmless looking steel pieces. Well, they're holding 7,000 horsepower to steam, and if they fail, how much water is in the big boy? Roughly 9,000 gallons when we're operating. You've got 9,000 gallons at 425 degrees. Steam expands 1,600 times its volume. That steam's going to blow out of that hole a long time. And it's not like compressed air. But you got a compressed air, you open it up, and it... There's your compressed air. Steam isn't like that. It blows for hours. That's if you don't have a fire behind it. So those are extremely critical. I remember when we were sourcing those, we were having a challenge finding somebody that would actually forge that specific alloy. It's a very technical, well, it's really not that technical, but it's a special alloy called 8630 modified vanadium alloy. And it's the good stuff. It's, it essentially represents what they were made, what they were originally manufactured. So it's exactly what Alco and Union Pacific wants them to be. Well, we can find that out, but finding somebody to make it into that shape while it's hot is going to be tough. And there were several people that, that didn't want to do it. And I remember having a conversation. If one of those fails, what would that mean? How much would that cost? You can't really put a cost on a catastrophic failure. Luckily, we found an outfit, Unit Drop Forge, cool name, and they made those. We had to buy 50 of them, but that's okay. And then we machine them exactly the way to the drawing and put them all together, and now we have a beautiful, beautiful throttle. I'll tell you a quick story here. Uh, two months ago, we went through our annual inspection, and it's a hydrostatic test, which means that you subject the boiler, all of the stuff I've been talking about, talking about, to 25% over its, its max pressure, which is 375 PSI. We warm up the water, we have a hydraulic pump, and we take it up nice and slow, take it up slow. The inspector's there, we get it to 375, and we go through a routine inspection looking at things. Then we drop that pressure down to about 295, 300, and we have to physically hammer test all the bolts that we can access. It takes a while, and it's, it's a racket. You probably hear it from over here. And uh, as we're doing it, that boiler's sitting there, and my job is to man the pump. And we've got a person on top manning that gauge. We've got a person in the cab manning that gauge. And now we're done, and we're ready to let the pressure off. And the pump's been shut off for 10 minutes, and we're still sitting there at 300 pounds. That throttle, not even so much as a drip. No drips of water, nothing. So we, we disengage everything. And of course, you don't want to let the pressure off quickly. You just let it come down gradually. We went to lunch, came back. It was a 260. And we're thinking, well, let's open up a little valve up here. So we start venting it. It took an hour and a half to get that pressure down to zero. That's because of all this beautiful work. And here we are machining the front engine and just more pictures of really cool things. The next picture of the valve bushings, more new parts. This is a really critical part of the locomotive because this is where the steam, and so I mentioned the steam's at 425 degrees. That's when it's in the boiler. It goes through a process known as superheating and it takes the temperature up. Anybody want to guess what that temperature is? Look at Mr. Finch, you're on it. 700 degrees. 700 degrees of superheat. Well, think about that. So when that steam pressure, again, think about a pot of spaghetti on your stove. Think about um, a pressure cooker. I remember as a kid, I was fascinated. Maybe that's what started my interest in steam overload. We had this pressure cooker, and there's this little counterweight, this little weight on top, and I was just, what? You take it off, steam coming out of there. It's nothing like that. The power of this locomotive, the steam is explosive. When that comes out of those superheaters, your throttle, you reach up there and the throttle is balanced, meaning you can operate it with these five fingers and pull it back. It takes a little bit of force, 
that's 7,000 horsepower you have right there. And that steam flows through those superheaters, light and fast, it's down into the cylinder. The valve is positioned to open and close these ports. On the inside, between this area and this area, is what we call the steam space, or the steam edge. That's the hottest part of that steam. That valve is exposed to 700 degrees. And as that valve moves over, and I'll show you what that valve looks like, as that valve moves over, these are the rings, again, all brand new. They're bronze and iron. Why are they bronze and iron? Well, they're moving real fast. They're exposed to tremendous heat. If they were just iron, they wouldn't work. If they were just bronze, they'd wear out. So they're a combination of bronze and iron. It's a neat, neat design. Same thing in the piston rings. Well, all this area in here is 700 degrees and 300 PSI. And so when you hear the big boy, the big boy's got a loud exhaust, but that exhaust has to travel a long way to get out the smoke box where you can hear it. 844 doesn't have to go very far. That 844 is like a shotgun or like a rifle. <laughs> That's what you're hearing, is that tremendous power of that steam. And that's what makes the steam locomotive operate, is that explosive power of that steam pressure. And then, it goes out the stack. Wasted. Gone. Used once, poof, gone. A lot of heat going right out the stack. That's why they got rid of the steam locomotive in 1959. Well, here we are. This is one of the last pictures we have. These are the piston rods, and this is the rear engine pistons, the piston and piston rod. We redesigned and we reused the same type of piston rings that the 844 has. It's a little bit of a more advanced design, it won't necessarily say better, but it's a little bit easier and it wears a little better. Challenger has a little bit of a different, one of the earlier designs. So did this, we made it into the 844. So that pretty much wraps up everything here. Uh, we've got a few minutes. If, if you're interested, we could uh, talk more steam engine things. If you haven't figured it out by now, I can talk for another hour. <laughs> this is a fascinating career that I've had. I'm very, very, very blessed and thankful that a person like me would have an opportunity. You know, a little kid when I was in school, I would dress like this if my school teacher were here. I'm in touch with some of them still today. They would chuckle because for Halloween, this is what I looked like <laughs> when I was six. We would go on family picnics and I had a striped cap and I even had the red bandana. I'm not, a, I'm not ashamed to admit it. So for me to have this opportunity in my life is just an absolute honor, it's a privilege. The Union Pacific lets us do this. And thank you for, for coming. And if, if you're interested, I'll entertain some questions. Talk about water consumption. Water consumption. Last question was water consumption. So the locomotive evaporates, it uses 200 gallons every mile. That's a lot of water. It's a very, even though I just a moment ago said it was inefficient, it's efficient as a steam locomotive goes. So when we're running down the track, we're evaporating 200 gallons of water a mile on average. That's what we calculate when we travel with the locomotive. We carry auxiliary water cars. You've seen the two extra water tenders that we have. They're filled with water as well. That gets us roughly maybe 220 miles, maybe a touch more. It's another reason why we have a diesel locomotive with us. If we're out there, we're delayed, and we're sitting there. The moment we light the fire in the morning, we're evaporating water. We're running all the appliances, the air pumps, the blower, the atomizing injectors, all those things. So unless we shut all that stuff off, the engine just sitting there is evaporating 10 or 15 gallons a minute. Just sitting there. When you replenish that, it needs to be treated water, right? Yeah, the question was when we replenish it's treated, correct. So back in 2011, we began to change, we changed the water treatment. There was essentially no water treatment at that time. There was a water treatment protocol that was in use uh, right about 2005, but there was a variety of reasons why it really wasn't administered. So the treated water goes through a softening system where we soften it. So just like in your house when you have hard water, if you live in a part of the country that's got a lot of calcium and magnesium, 
you soften it by taking those out, and there's a process that we use to do that. It's a big, heavy duty water softener. Is that built into the tool car or something? It is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we put that in the, uh, in the water in the uh, tool car. We also are building a second tool car. It'll be online hopefully next year. We'll look have what's called a nano filtration system. It's a really big, complex system. And that takes you to the next level. Very good question. Yes, sir? How much of coal did the big boy carry during and after World War II? How much coal did it carry? We were designed to carry 28 tons. And as time went on, just like everything, you increase that because they needed to go a little bit farther with that load of coal. They carry about 32 tons by the time you got it all stacked up there. So let's talk about that for a minute. So the railroads back then were different than they are today. A train will come up here and maybe there's not a crew ready. Uh, maybe there's some other situation where it has to wait on some other trains to come down the hill. And the train can sit there for a while. It can sit there for hours. If it's windy out, sometimes we can't run trains because the wind could blow over some of those tall cars. So a train could sit here for days, not on a steam locomotive. When that train was ready to go, the locomotive and the crew were called, and they top off the water, top off the coal. The crew, brakeman, fireman, engineer would report over to the roundhouse, get on that locomotive, take it out, go get it on their train, get it air tested, and leave. If you had any delays, you, you, you're going to have to take water and coal at Harriman. Everybody know where Harriman is up on the hill for those that live here? It was very important that you, you really manage that carefully. Even though we talk about efficiency on a steam locomotive, even back then you tried to do everything you could to run your locomotive efficiently. Good question. Yes? The Blizzard of 49, there yeah. are quite a few of them. Well, during the blizzard of 49, you mentioned that several locomotives had frozen. Well, they, they would have to be towed back to the shop. If there was anything broken, which invariably there would be, pipes that weren't drained. Uh, I'm familiar with that type of a situation down on one of the railroads that I grew up around, the Rio Grande, and they had stories of engines freezing on Corona Pass at 12, almost 12,000 feet of elevation. And the crew would stay with the locomotive as long as they could. And most of the time they could keep it hot, keep the fire going, keep the steam pressure up to prevent it from freezing. But if it did freeze, as if they were in the process of draining it to get the water out, they would disassemble everything and try to drain all the water out to protect it. The blizzard of 49 was so severe, and those locomotives so big and so complex, they did what they could, but a lot of them froze. And they just, when they broke them loose, they told them back. Most of them were, were not too far from Cheyenne. But it would be, it was a real mess. Good question. Yes? Um, so why convert it to oil versus keeping it with coal? Why convert it to coal, or excuse me, why convert it to oil, then convert it to coal? That's a good question. Well, we've got 28 tons of coal, and coal smells cool. You know, it does, I admit it. Coal is not a popular fuel in our world today. You know, there's, there's just concerns about a lot of things. It is, it is essentially a very dirty fuel, especially when burned in that manner. But it, it creates, it doesn't burn all the way down, so it creates little cinders, kind of like your barbecue when you throw some charcoal briquettes on there. And you end up, when you're done, you come back a few days later, you got a bunch of ash in there, and you got some chunks and some pieces. Well, coal is even worse because when coal is formed in Mother Nature, it's, it's made of all kinds of stuff. It's got pieces of shale, which is kind of rock. It's all kinds of other stuff, depending on where you mine the coal. Well, all of that has to go somewhere. It ends up being a giant pile of ashes. So when we, let's say that we, we burned, we, we had a coal burning 4014. Well, we probably would have made it to Laramie before they shut us down because we, we very well would have started a lot of fires. Not only when we got to Laramie, we would need to have a carload of coal waiting for us and a means to load that coal into the tender. 
But now we've got those ash pans, and on the 4014 they were really big, and they're full. And now we got to dump those. So, from my mind, as much as I love coal burning locomotives, there was never any question that we were going to convert the engine to oil. And in my early part of my steam locomotive career, I, I had been introduced to oil burning locomotives and fell in love with it. Not only because it was easier and cleaner, but there was the science behind an oil burning locomotive was a little bit different than a coal burner. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Do you like coal burning steam locomotives? A lot of people do. It's okay. It's fun. Uh, a lot of the railroads, uh, the Durango and Silverton, other railroads out there, they've, they've been challenged with fires and just so many different things. And so they're working toward converting their engines to burn coal too. Or excuse me, to burn oil. There's always the story of the Nail Creek Bridge. Pardon me? The Nail Creek Bridge, the original Nail Creek That burned? Yeah. The cabins at either end and the guys in the back of the water. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, I was commenting about one of the early structures out west of Cheyenne was a wooden structure over Dale Creek. It's no longer part of the transcontinental line in 19, what was it, 1901? When, when was that? So right around there, it was replaced with a line relocation. But because of the coal burning locomotives, it burned the bridge down. <laughs> and that happened a lot. All right, well, any more questions? I thought I saw one more hand. There we go. I've been following the syllabus guys on Facebook and it looks like they're making tremendous progress already, so I've been impressed by that. But what what can you tell us about that? And also, you, have you passed on your knowledge or you got a, a Ed Dickens out there at syllabus to, to carry this on for 5511 and Challenger? Well, as, as you saw from the slides, you know, as it, complicated and as complex as it looks, if you break it down to individual component parts, parts the steam locomotive really is a, is a simple machine. And when you, when you get through the, the awe of what lies ahead, disassembling it and rebuilding it really is just hard work. Uh, I'm responsible for helping them rebuild uh, the tender. That's part of the agreement. So we're going to work with them to rebuild that tender. And, uh, and as needed, you know, we've got an agreement that I, I'm helping them out too. You know, anything that we can do, I mean, we've, we've developed a lot of tricks and techniques. Again, not that they couldn't or anybody else couldn't figure them out, but we, we kind of have the path forward. You know, the tooling that we've made, we've made lots of really cool parts. And so they're going to have to go do all that over again, unless there's a pathway for us to, to lend assistance. So to answer your question, yeah, they've got some great, really talented folks out there, don't know to your point, making outstanding progress. And if they ever want help, um, I'm, I'm just honored to help them. That was my intention, was to rebuild that locomotive. It was sad to see it go, but it will live again, so I'm happy for that. Certainly. Is, is the 3985 inside now? Yes. The 3985's question was, is it inside? And it is, it's within that big facility, <coughs> and that's where it will reside until it's running again. And it will remain there. That will be its new home. Yes, ma'am. Do you have a tour planned this year? Do we have a tour uh, with the locomotive? Yes. And I can talk about that because we just announced it today. So we're taking the locomotive to Omaha, Nebraska for a College World Series. Back in 2011, we built, the Union Pacific built this nice display track right downtown Omaha. And the big boy is going to be right next to that ball field. And uh, we might every now and then blow the whistle when there's a home run. <laughs> but people will be able to see it. We just announced it. And I, I folded that. Let me see which pocket I put it in here. I actually have the, uh, the schedule with me if anybody had any questions. But we're going to run what we call the Yoder sub. I see Jim Coker back there. He knows all about the Yoder sub. And Jim is, uh, used to be our steam crew conductor. He's a retired UP conductor. But we'll run up the Yoder sub to Gary and from Gary down what we call our Laurel sub. That's our big coal line down in North Platte. And then on to Grand Island, Council Bluffs. And we'll be on display for 10 days. And then we work our way back. 
So we're excited to get out. We'll be out about 25 days and have the locomotive on public display downtown Omaha. Yes, sir. Is it possible to stop in Um. Yeah, sometimes, so when I plan the trips, I, I try to structure it so we, we kind of hop, skip, and jump. And rather than stop at the same location, sometimes we do for logistical reasons or because it's, it's, it's better logistically. And other times I like to kind of mix it up to stop at other communities. You never know, the dispatcher might stop us there for a train meet or something. But I, I put a lot of thought into planning where we're stopping and why. Yeah, we're we're gonna hit uh, Chapel. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I like I said, I put a lot of thought into that, trying to figure out how we can kind of spread it around a little bit for communities. We're gonna stop at Overton instead of Carney on the way back, and you know, just things like that, just to to uh, you know visit those communities. There's a nice pedestrian overpass at Overton, and a nice park where people can come park there, and so Julesburg's a nice place too. Bruce, did I see your hand in the corner of my eye? Yeah, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna. I'm sure everybody saw that big monster behind it, mm -hmm. and uh, we happen to have the creator of that here is uh, Cato Bleach. Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> I don't embarrass him too much. Uh, he spent six years starting in high school on that, oh, and even cool. just uh, finished up some new uh, trim pieces everything else for it, and he's donating that, graciously donating To me. Oh, oh man. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't slip me enough. <laughs> but he's donating it to the, to the Depot Museum. So Caleb represents a generation of people who are interested in this old, obsolete, tired machine. Why in the world do we care about this stuff? Well, I'm very, very pleased and privileged to know Caleb and, and others like him that are the next generation that are into this technology. There's a lot to be learned. Uh, Caleb, if, if, if you don't mind, what, what's your, your, you're graduating soon, right? December. Uh, engineering? Yep. Yeah. So think about the engineering degree that he has and the dedication to see a project through. And that is what I look at when I see something like this. It's one thing to set up your 3D printer and to print a few little pieces on your spare time. It's another thing to go through and canvas the, the vast drawings and come up with all of the programming, because he has to program that little printer. I think it's a pretty big printer, isn't it? So this is, this is quite an accomplishment, Caleb. Really be proud of yourself for what you've done. And if you look at it here in a few minutes, come up and take a look at it. You look at the accuracy and the detail. It's really, really a beautiful job. It'll make a nice piece here. Well, let's see, uh, what time do we got here? We're at 7.57. We're at 7.57. All right, we've got three minutes. Uh, the one right over here? Uh, our question was if I've been to the Burlington Roundhouse. Uh, when I was in the military during the 1980s, I remember looking at it. I've driven by there a few times, and it, it's repurposed as another building, if I, if I have it right, isn't it? A warehouse, yeah. They've taken it all I don't know. I, I'm not that familiar with it. Yes, sir. A uh, question about uh, <coughs> diesels you have out there, the D9s. Uh, could you share what you think the future is for those? This question was about our E9s. We've got one stored outside because we don't have enough room inside for it. We've got the two A units. So the E9s are our streamliners. They were built in 1955 and they have that rounded, streamlined look. And we're hanging on to those, and as time goes on, when they have a desire to run them, we'll be ready to run them. You know, they'll, they'll need PTC, of course, and they need a few, or, few other structural uh, upgrades to make them strong, what we call crash-worthy. You know, they don't meet certain standards in our world today, so we'd have to, you know, provide that upgrade. 
that they're essentially ready to go. Two A units stored inside. As soon as I get room, I'll put that other B unit inside. That's a good question. Well, I think that pretty much covers it. We've, uh, like I said, I, I really appreciate this, and it's been a pleasure talking with everyone. And I'm very, uh, very thankful to the Union Pacific to allow us to have the opportunity to talk about a steam locomotive in 2023. You know, who would really think that that a, a corporation, a railroad, would have a locomotive like this, like this, the full-size version of Caleb's 4000. So we thank everybody for coming, and for those of you that will be coming to Depot Days, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow and Sunday. We have an open house over there, and it's the first time since 2018, so we're very excited about that. And again, I thank Christy and thank Sarah and everyone at the Depot Museum, our partners over here. Uh, they field a lot of questions, and they're, they're kind of our distant partner. We are so close, but yet we're so far, aren't we? Okay. Such a good one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all.